and welcome to Fat Squirrel Speaks. Today is Wednesday, March 18th, and this is an episode. I am Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. It's been actually, I think, less than two weeks. It's been about two weeks since we talked last. It's also been two years. So, I'm going to keep it silly at the beginning. <laughs> we'll talk about what's coming up in my life in gardening. We'll talk about procrastination. We'll talk about like what board game Tove and I are really loving at this moment. I'll talk about my knitting and my spinning. Um, I'll talk about a shop update that I'll have the last Friday of March. And then maybe we'll just kind of like chitty chat. Just like have a moment. So that way, if you're not interested in having a moment, I feel you. that's cool. We'll put the fun stuff at the beginning. Today is coffee because pandemics justify so many cups of coffee. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about procrastination. Um, so I don't know about y'all. But my brain has not been doing great at being on track this week, in the last two weeks. So I've had a few tiny procrastination projects, which I just want to share with you because if you need something to, di to diversify your brain a little bit, to do something other than the woolly goodness, to give your tendons a moment, give your tendons, got that knitter, that tennis elbow, got that tendonitis from all of the wooliness, give yourself a little something else to do. Um, <laughs> So these are just a few, but I've made several napkins this week because I find it to be kind of relaxing, actually. These are just little napkins, but I, to be honest with you, I find these the most useful for me in my daily life. Um, these were only about 11 inches square before I hemmed them. Um, so when I'm making napkins, what I do is pre-wash the fabric that I have and then cut it into a workable shape. Um, I had used a little bit of this fabric for another craft. It was a fat quarter. And so I just kind of divided what was left uh, and then squared it up. And all I do to do that is just, if this were an une uh, unhemmed piece of fabric, I just fold it on a 45. So make yourself like a little square. And whatever is overlapping down here, I just trim off like with a rotary cutter or a bitch new scissors or whatever. Um, and then I do, I'll go to the iron. I turn down a quarter inch and then another quarter inch so that there's essentially there's a triple layer of fabric right at the edge. And then I do a little mitered corner, which you can find many tutorials on. See, mine are not perfect. Full disclosure. But I do a little mitered corner and then just whip up them on the whip up them. Just go around the edge on the sewing machine and you got little napkins. But I do find that this like I've used, um, like if I had half yard of something, I've used like 18 by 18 squares thinking, oh, I'm gonna maximize the amount of fabric I use for this project. But really, and I do use those napkins. I don't have any laying around here, do I? But they are quite big. And so they end up like, I feel like I'm wasting napkin, which is silly because it's just getting it washed and whatever. But I like these a lot because they feel like just the perfect amount like maybe if you're eating your homemade pizza, this is not quite enough napkin, but generally this is enough napkin for me. Anyway, so that is one thing I've been doing. Because ironing, if you have to iron, not fun. Ironing as like a meditative practice, totally enjoyable. <laughs> and so this is where I use the other part of that fat quarter, I made myself a couple pillowcases. Oh, the other one is upstairs. I should have brought it down too. Do you love this fabric so much? If you do, I'm having bags out of it. Sorry, self-promotion, shamelessly, but with a little bit of shame. Right. So pillowcases are a perfect project if you have a fabric that you love so much but you're just not sure that you maybe want a garment out of it or 
you have more than you would need for napkins. Um, a pillowcase, a standard size pillowcase takes about a yard. Um, if you want to do it like with a cute little border, you can do this as a third contrast. And if you do that, I think you need like three quarters of the main, just a few inches of the contrast, and then a quarter of the, the third fabric. So um, this fabric runs differently. Like it does, you have to pay attention to how the print runs. There's a starling. I see you, sir. There, <laughs> you have a print fabric. Um, like for example, this one, a yard would have not, not been enough because of how the print runs. So I actually needed the width and length. Does that make sense? So instead of a yard, I needed like 40 inches, 42 inches. Sorry, my nose is itchy. I needed like 42 inches. So yeah, you didn't need to pay attention to that. But I made another one with fat quarters. I was just going to try. I knew that that was too small. So I made one fat quarter for the front, one fat quarter for the back. And then I just trimmed for the, for the contrast. And it was too small, but luckily, um, it was perfect for like my, a buckwheat pillow. So it's very cute too. And I apologize that I didn't think to bring it down. So those have been enjoyable procrastinations. Are you procrastinating? Are you going outside your woolly crafts? Are you, there's a kit. Well, it's not a kit, but it is a kit. I got a spoon carving set for Christmas and I really want to get into that one. I'm kind of waiting for warmer weather because I feel like it's something I want to do outside, which for no real reason, because like, I don't care about mess. <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm messy. Um, but I kind of want to do it outside. I've really been wanting to carve spoons, so that's been a non-wooly craft that I want to do. I also have this, um, you know, like the egg baskets, like the... You know what I mean? I bought last year at our wool festival, which has unfortunately been canceled this year. Um, I bought like a little frame, essentially, with just the the supportive um, bits. You're like, this makes no sense to me. Um, but I bought like, so like, basically I bought the warp and I need to put in the weft. Um, it's, so it's just like the little frame and I need to put some, some yarn in it and weave around or fabric. Um, to make the the actual body of the basket and so see it's kind of like this kind but instead of having the reed go over that you're weaving with do you over and under you would use yarn or fabric strips or wool strips or or many many things so that's one thing I really want to work on I just need to decide what hand spun to put in there Maybe just like straight up. No, let's not do straight up wool. Although I am excited about that. Now that I think about it. I'm just saying. But other things that we've been doing that are non-wooly. We've been taking walks. But also, Tova's new favorite game. And it's my favorite because she wants to play it. Is Quacks of Quindlinburg. What... Is that not the most ridiculous title ever? Yes, it is. Is it super cute? Also, yes. Um, so this is kind of a push your leg, push your luck bag building game. So you might've heard of deck building games. This one you're building up um, little chits that you pull out of a bag. Um, and so it has elements both of strategy and luck. And it has very cute components. And basically what you're doing is you're making potions. And there are certain potion ingredients that will make you bust if you go over a certain number of them. Um, so there's a push your luck kind of element. And you get to buy new things to put in your potion bag. It's highly enjoyable. There's an expansion for it called uh, the Quacks of Quinlanburg, the Herb Witches. So the base player game is to four people. I think it's two to four. You could totally play it by yourself, though. 
even if it doesn't tell you you can two to four but i think the um the expansion adds two players um the ages are 10 and up but really if your kiddos can add um and not even like they need to be able to add to basically 10 and just adding one two or three so um if they can do that comfortably um, then they could totally play this. It doesn't require a lot of word or a lot of reading. Um, there are kind of like descriptions of what the little chits do, like their magical potion properties. Um, but of course, it's just, you know, so just use your judgment. I don't know about your local game stores, but our local game store is offering um, like call ahead ordering. So you can order and then just show up. You can pay over the phone. Um, just show up and pick up and I think they're even doing delivery so if you have a local game company you might want to just check out um, and see if they're offering anything like that but so we're really enjoying Quacks and Quinlinburg oh I shouldn't have told you how long it takes it's also not a very long game it says 45 minutes and I would say that that's maybe even generous especially with two people um even when you have multiple people though you'd have kind of simultaneous turns so um it shouldn't take that much longer to play for example a six person game versus a two person game uh there is a few things that might take you know that bump it up a little bit but the majority of the game is played simultaneously which is also great for younger players who might not have super awesome attention spans it does mean it's not as easy to as easy to knit to i will you know i'll put that out there you have a trade-off. Uh, <laughs> did you just see Gus's floofy tail? He's going to sit with us. So, yeah, we've really been enjoying that. I'm trying to think if we've been playing anything. We've been doing that. We've been playing Welcome To. We have re rolling rights are really enjoyable. Um, just because they're satisfying. You feel like you're completing something. Um, so that is like a... Like, I don't know, especially when other things feel uncertain and like, uh, completing a little like map or a little grid or like tangibly doing something feels good. Um, so we've been enjoying, um, Welcome To and, um, Cartographers. So I think I talked about Cartographers before, uh, but that's still an enjoyable game for us. So yay! And then, gardening. <gasps> what? It's true. Spring is coming. We've been feeling it here in central Indiana. We've had some warmer days. Tomorrow, we're supposed to get a thunderstorm. I saw on the weather thing, the like lightning bolt. <gasps> what? Right. Thunderstorms are happening again. Um, so, yeah, like... Kind of mid-March is when um, you can plant peas a little bit earlier. I've never planted, I don't, I've never successfully planted peas. I may have tried before. Um, but I've got, we did this weekend, Tove and I went out and did, you know, some regular yard pickup stuff and, and my husband as well. And then we cleaned out, um, we have just like four by four raised beds in our backyard. So we have a total of eight of those um sorry my brain just did something funny i think i miscounted when i i had my daughter <laughs> draw our map out for the garden this year and she didn't have her glasses on for some ridiculous reason like my child has very poor vision like very poor and it occurs to me that i didn't double check and i think she may have miscounted the beds but whatever that's an aside <laughs> we did go outside no she didn't she didn't she didn't. that was four five yeah okay we're good we're good um so we got outside kind of prepped a couple of beds um we had this plant netting that we used last year for trellising of our beans and our cucumbers and it has we left it out all winter kind of as an experiment and kind of because lazy uh, and it actually has held up really well um we were able to do three beds so 12 foot so it must have been like 40 foot of netting or something because we had three rows of 12 foot netting 
And what we did is on each end, we just zip tied it to like T posts. Um, and then what we needed to do mid season when the vining got too heavy on them is that we went in and took um, a PVC pipe and ran it through the top of the netting um, and then put that on a T post to kind of support the middle a little bit more. Um, but it's held up really well. It looks brand new. Um, so we're going to use that again this year, but we need to kind of reposition stuff, um, rotate things around a bit. Um, and so we'll be doing that here soon, but we did get our pea plants in the ground just to kind of get them going. And we've got our cucumbers and tomatoes started. So those are on the heat mats now, and as soon as they start to sprout, we'll get them under lights. Um, but yeah, exciting, right? So we're going to use our netting again, and then I bought some... We have had some two foot, what is it called? Welded wire fencing. So the grids I think are like two by four or something, like the space between the wires I think is two by four. Um, and it is PVC coated, it's like the green like kind. We've had that fencing for six years maybe longer. And now we have brought it in. We have not let it winter outside. But we've brought it in. I think we've brought it in every year. One year we didn't. I just remembered that. But we, we pretty much have brought it in every year. And I know there's been a few years we haven't used it, but it is also doing really well. Um, so we decided to get some four foot. Uh, we didn't get the coated because it was pretty pricey. We're just going to try galvanized. We're going to try the four foot and do that as our other trellising this year for our tomatoes. So we'll try that out. The cattle panels are very exciting, but logistically they're a challenge. <laughs> There's no cattle panel delivery in like my minivan is not going to bring them here. Um, so yeah, we're we'll doing that this year. So it's all happening. We're not going to do, last year we did, if you've been with me for a while, last year we did a Three Sisters Garden where we did the corn squash tomato, or corn squash beans. Um, we're not going to do that again this year, uh, but we will be doing, we're going to do, we do really a limited garden. Um, honesty, not a lot of people in my house, nobody except me, enjoy fresh produce that much so <laughs> I try to make our little garden um, more for preserving than for immediate eating and so um, we're gonna do tomatoes this year and I do preserve the majority of those we're not a huge fresh tomato family um, I do enjoy salsa immensely but that's mostly how we use our fresh tomato um, so we'll be doing a tomato garden for preserving. I will do cucumbers again for sweet pickles because I have a sweet pickle. It's not a problem. It's really not, but I do enjoy sweet pickles. Um, so, and those have, la those have done really well this year. Um, they have, you know, now we're not, we're not into a full year of them. We're what, nine months or something of them, eight months. Um, but they're still doing, and they're very crunchy. The texture of them is really great. Um, so I've been really pleased with how those have held up um, through the year. So we'll be doing uh, a small pickles, and then we're going to do green beans because that is what I want to do well, because that is my family tradition. Um, my grandfather always put up um, white half runners. Well, he always planted white half runners, and then my mama would can just like quartz and quartz and quartz of them. She would put them in, do you remember Avon boxes? I don't know what Avon comes in anymore, but it used to come in these really nice, um, heavy cardboard boxes that had like a lift off lid. It wasn't like the flat lid, it was a lift off. And in their basement, there would just be, like there was one wall that was just quartz and quartz and quartz and quartz of green beans. I don't even know how many she canned every year. But she would have like two pressure canners running pretty much 
nonstop. And like if you were there, you got a grocery, a paper grocery bag and you were snapping peas, beans. Because, you, you know, that's just what you were doing. I was a kid and didn't snap nearly enough. Shame on me. Even when I was a teen, I did not snap nearly enough. Shame on me. It's a natural part of being a, a young person. But anyway, so I want my mama and my papa with me when I'm doing that. And so last year we planted, we planted, um, it's the first year I have planted runner beans. Um, and I just did not have good success with them. I, I definitely needed to prune them more. I think they also had too rich of a soil. So this year I'm moving them to where the tomatoes were last year. Um, to see if that, sh that soil would be slightly more depleted since the tomatoes really went crazy last year. And then this year we're going to be much more adamant about pruning. Pruning. But I hope they go well. Do you want to see what seeds we got this year? These are not all the seeds because we have some left over. There was a few that I bought that didn't need to. Maybe I should start a seed file of facts so I know what I have. Okay. Uh, but this year we purchased from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange um, upon recommendation of Joanna Knitspin Farm. Notice that farm is in her RAV handle. Oh, oh my gosh, did you see? If you're on Instagram, um, Joanna is going to do a virtual farm festival this year. A virtual wool festival. Farm festival. A virtual festival. She's a genius. I'm so excited. <laughs> so if you're on Instagram, you should keep an eye out. Also, I'm pretty sure she has um, email updates if you go to her web, her web store or her blog. Um, but I'm super excited about that. Yeek. But so anyway, upon her recommendation, uh, a, she showed me her catalog, and can we just, I don't have my catalog, but look at the cover. This was basically, the cover art had gnomes on it, except there was a, a lady gnome with hairy legs in a, in a bathing suit, which was, you got me, Southern Seed Exchange, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, You're, I'm in, 100%, 100%. But like, how cute are they? <laughs> so not all of their seed art is the gnomes, but. So this year we're gonna try carrots. I've never, so we got ox heart carrots. I'm excited about doing carrots. What else do we have? Okay, so we used Amish paste tomatoes. And then we used, let's see what else tomatoes. We didn't do the long toms this year. We were just already crazy. Just, it was nuts. We tried these Bisignano, 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 I don't know. Um, but what we look for, I say we, what I look for <laughs> is um, indeterminate, that's right, right? Uh, paste tomatoes, that's what we're looking to grow. And then we did a few Cherokee purples um, that we had left over from last year. So those are our tomatoes that we're growing. And then last year we did a combination of Boston pickling and homemade pickle cucumbers. And to be honest with you, I don't know which one was which, but they both seem to be fine. <laughs> and man, that we had so many cucumbers. According to Square Foot Gardening, you can plant approximately 37,000 cucumbers in a, in a four by four foot area. <laughs> and they did so well. Like at the end, I was like not even taking care of them because I was just like, slow down cucumbers because we had enough. And also we were getting like some pests and stuff. Actually, the cucumbers never had pests on them, but they started getting like blotchy. And so I was like, oh, I'll just let those die back. And they just did not die. I mean, they slowed down their production significantly, but they kept going. Good job on you, cucumbers. But then, <laughs> so then, oh, so the peas we grew this year, we, do, we grew green arrows. And then like an Alaska one, I think. Now I need to, now that we're talking together, I think this one is dwarf. 
It doesn't tell me if it's dwarf or not. So I may need to get those trellises up sooner than I thought. It doesn't tell me, I'll have to check it out. But anyway, so I got those going. And then for green beans this year, we have left over some. I have a green bean problem, y'all. <laughs> We're gonna try these. These are Donald Todd Half Runners. Um, we're going to try NT Half Runners. And then we're going to try Lazy Wife Greasy. Because quite frankly, any bean with the name Greasy in it, I'm in. Because it's just super cute. So we'll probably do those. I still have some Kentucky. I still have several different kinds of beans from last year. So I'll be growing those as well. It'll be a cornucopia. And then we'll do lettuces and stuff as well. Because those are always fun. And they just are enjoyable. So that's the plan at this point. At this moment. Tova saved some pumpkin seeds from last year. From a pumpkin that she really loved. That we got at our orchard. So she saved those back. So we're experimenting with those as well. Um, so she wanted to get those planted which I was like it's way too early but you do you sweets so we have some more seeds and then we might I don't think I'm gonna do any more winter squash this year I just was not very successful with them last year and I need to get a different system whoa I got really red all of a sudden how'd that happen um, I need to get a different, I think I want to trellis them. So that's going to be like somewhere a little bit further down the line. Oh, hello, Mr. Cardinal. You're so flashy. Um, so yeah, but I still have those seeds, which I'm excited about because one of them is like hopey blue. Mm. So yeah, maybe that'll be next year's financial investment for the garden. It's hard with the garden. Like I'm, I tend to be a person who... The garden is a good lesson for me. Uh, I tend to be a person who wants to do everything right from the beginning. Like I want to over research things. I want to be very prepared for things. And the reality of gardening is, I mean, obviously if you had an unlimited budget, that wouldn't be an issue, but it, it is def in order for it to be a good balance for our household. I can't just go out and just get everything I think I want at once. For one thing, like I'm still such a, a new gardener. Um, and so like, I don't really know what we need yet. Right. And then, um, cause so things are going to change and next year we might not want this, but we might want that. And so it's just a good lesson for me to try to do things smaller, to try to accumulate these things over, a, a number of years to try to make our investments match what we're getting from the garden. Um, and again, that's all about a personal, like that's all down to like your household and like what you value. And because it's, I don't know how to really even do gardening in a way that it's cheaper than food that you buy at the grocery store because that food is so, kind of removed um, from what it actually costs. Do you know what I mean? Like the environmental costs are not calculated into it. The human labor costs are not calculated into it. But there's so many costs that aren't actually in that thing that it's really not helpful to compare the cost of gardening to that cost because it'll never, because it's, it's skewed, right? Like, because those costs have been artificially removed from what you're buying at a grocery store, um, you can't do an apples to apples comparison of what you're growing in your garden. Um, so, and that is to say that then every family can put different values on what you're getting from the garden. Um, is it just knowing the labor that goes into it, that it's your labor and that it's willing labor and that it's, you know, or is it just the pleasure of doing it, much like knitting, like just the pleasure of the process? Is it, you know, there's so many things that you can place a different value on depending on what you personally are looking for in the garden. Well, where did, where are we going? <laughs> so.
so that's gardening <laughs> for now. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about wool stuff. Spinning. Should I, sh I should show you what they looked like because I got two bumps of fiber from Moon Kitten Studios and they were absolutely gorgeous, but I want to show them to you because she does a slightly different dye, uh, fiber dyeing than, than you most commonly find. Um, here we go. Here's the picture of them. So this is from her Instagram feed. So she dyes them, you know, with the colors sequential versus interspersed. So I bought two bumps of this. It is called New Beginnings. It's Superwash Tar Heat. And I what it's since it's super wash and it's such fun colors, I thought it'd be great for like charity, like uh, knitting mittens and what have you, or just kid mitts or whatever. So I did not try to keep the colors together. So what I did was one braid I split in half like long ways. So I had two strips, um, two thinner strips, and I just spun them. Um, for example, I think it's gray to orange. So I did gray to orange, orange to gray. And then, sorry. And then the other ply I stripped into, I think, five sections. I was trying for six, but didn't make it. I stripped into five sections and did the same, like A to B, B to A, A to B, B to A it's progression. Um, so yeah, and I just did it pretty fluffy and pretty fat. And I got something like 380 yards for 200 grams. Isn't it fun? And just says, I am. Right? So just super fast, well not super fast, but fast and fluffy and very good. So I really enjoy Superwash Tar Heat. It's very pleasant to spin. It feels great and it's, yeah, it's a highly enjoyable fiber. And it takes my hair. Um, <laughs> so I did that and then I went in ahead and got, um, last year I went to, the Fiber Festival that's held at Young's Dairy, the Wool Gathering in um, Yellow Springs, Ohio. And there I bought two of these, right? Shut up. So this is also Moon Kitten Studios. At the time she was um, Bitter Buffalo Fibers. Uh, but this one is also Superwash Tarki and it's called Clairvoyant. Does that? So this, so this one, um, I spun the first ply just as it came. So just like this. And then I think I'm going to do the same with this bump. Um, I haven't quite decided. I really did. I've gone back and forth approximately 75 million times. But I think I'm going to do this bump the same. I thought about chain plying it. Um, that's the other thing that's. I might chain ply it, but we'll see. It's going to be chain plied or I'll try to match up the two plies. Um, I did, the only reason I'm hesitant to do the matching up of the two plies is that when I first started, I was just like, yay, and I was having fun and I was not, I mean, I'm never a super consistent spinner, but I was probably like wicked inconsistent. So I'm probably going to have to trash some singles from this. Well, I don't have to trash them. I could just ply them up in a two ply ball and that's what I'll do if I do that. Um, so like for example, I probably will have more of this purple color, especially um, on this second braid. So what I would do is start to ply and then if I have too much overlap, so if for example, I've moved on to brown, what's, or this very dark eggplant black, and I'm on one ply, but I'm still on the purple on the other one, I would just pull those purple singles off into, um, I would actually probably either 
um, Andy and ply it where you wrap it around your hand. By the way, I never thought I could do that. It's so cool. Hanging out with spinners is amazing because they teach you that you can do things and you're like, what? So if it's just a little bit, I could just pull it off on an Indian ply and then ply it on a different wheel right away or on a spindle. Um, or if it's like a bunch, I would just pull it off on the, bull, the ball winder, set it aside, and then do a two ply of it later. I feel like I'm talking a lot today and maybe not making a lot of sense. <laughs> Some of us just do that all the time. <laughs> um, that really should be the still for the video. Um, so yeah, I haven't decided, but I think I'm going to do a two ply because I think my three ply might be a little chunky. Obviously, I'm okay with that. Here we are. Um, <clears throat> just to give you like reference points, this is my hip line, my bending waist. This is my under bust. This is like the fullest part of my bust. Here it is with, so you can see the armhole depth in terms of, yeah. Here it is from the side. Um, I did not put any waist shaping in this sweater. But I think just because of the stitch um, texture, it's basically <clears throat> like a moss stitch, which kind of has one by one-ish tendencies. It's very stretchy. So like if I pull it tight, it does have a good um, sort of elasticity to it. Um, things I did different. Um, I did change the length because, you know, that's always the easiest thing to do. My sleeve length is probably different than what's suggested. Um, I just went with what felt right. Um, I was concerned that we might get like some lengthening in the sleeve, um, but it really didn't, was an effect when I blocked the sweater. So I think, you know, if I pull it down, I can be cozier, but the natural way it hits is right just barely below my bending wrist. So I don't have buttons yet, obviously. Well, maybe not obviously. I don't have buttons yet. Those are coming in the mail. But um, overall, I'm really satisfied with it. And I would put it on, I was like, just being, being silly, because I was like, whatever, this doesn't match, but quarantine, okay. But actually, I totally like the mustard with this kind of smoky aqua thing. What's that about? I didn't know those were colors that I dug together. Apparently they are. So the yarn I've used is Brooklyn Tweed Loft in the Hayloft colorway. Um, and I have enjoyed every moment of making this dang sweater. Even when I was on the sleeves. This has been such a high value project for me. I, you know, if you can, you know, any yarn that you can just really love and just, oh, I've just enjoyed the process of this cardigan so much. It's not been a particularly difficult knit. I mean, it's not been like a technically difficult knit. Um, it's not been a, it's been like just such a sweet spot of thought, momentum, material, kindness, gratitude. I mean, it's just had so much, like so many of the best boxes ticked off. And I, you know, I'm almost, I'm not sad to have it be finished because I think I'm really going to love this finished object, but boy, it was like a good book series. It was hard to see it end. Um, so I still don't have buttons. I'm, I'm waiting for those. I think I'm, I think I've found the buttons I want to use for it. Um, Oh, he did a beautiful job on the pattern. Um, yeah, it's got great size inclusive inclusivity. It has a great bicep measurement for my corn fed arm folk. Swing and wing it. 
amazing. I love how it, yeah, I love it. I'm, I really am digging it. Now, it's far too early to technically say that because I have not actually, this is the first time I've had it on my body for more than five minutes and I'm not doing anything, but whatever. So far, I'm really jazzed about it. And of course, I will keep you updated as to how it keeps going. Um, but yeah, I have just enjoyed everything about it. It's gorgeous. Oh my gosh, and right? Did you see the, how it looks with this teal? What's up? I love it. I never thought that those two colors were, like, I didn't understand that. I, I mean, it makes sense. I feel like I've had fiber that had those two colors in it before, but, oh, I'm, uh, I'm into it. I mean, this is not, this is like somewhere between teal and like robin's egg. I love it. I finished my hat by Sarah Jordan. You follow me on Instagram. I'm such a mess. If you follow me on Instagram, uh, the day that Tub and I went out and worked on the garden boxes and did a bunch of work outside, I had just finished this hat. I hadn't blocked it. It was, you know, I still had the um, the the like leftover ball of of yarn in the crown, and I was like. Oh, I was like, I'm so surprised that this hat just sits up by itself. I mean, it actually will if you try to get it to. But I was like, I, I'm, I'm kind of liking it. I, I dig it. And then I came inside and realized that the reason it was sticking up so much was because it had a ball of yarn in it. <laughs> However, if you want to stick up, it will stick up really nicely by itself. And you can even highlight. See, the hat has the tri-corner or the, the three-corner top, like the cookie. The hat, of course, is a Kova Shelly by Sarah Jordan. I'll put the link in the little drop down. I won't put the link in the drop down, but I'll put the name in the drop down. I'm oh, so that's what I was going to do. I was going to show it to you with the, the two points towards you. Right? I kind of like it. And like, you know, if you need to do some social distancing, This hat means business. So right. So this is hand spun. It's brioche. And I, I'm not going to lie to you. I think I want to make another one of these like instantly. I really just love how it feels on my head. You could either wear it slouchy like you're a total cool cat or not. It's up to you has a slight biasing which I really enjoy and I just it feels really good on the head it doesn't feel tight on your forehead it just feels like a little hug just a hug it's awesome and then I also okay I gotta take my sweater off though because oh, I'm, I'm too warm. I also finished my Piper's Journey shawl, y'all. So this is a pattern by Paula Emmons Feasley. And it is a crescent shape garter shawl with an applied lace edge. Right. This is my hand spun. Um, Knit Spin Farm did a bat vent this year where you got a little mini bat every day for December. So I spun those and then chain plied it. This is my yarn. It has some exciting sparkle in it. It's just super homey Christmas time. Solstice y'all. And then what I did is I wanted to do some white in it to just really hammer home the winter timeness. So I worked the border in, um, Beaver Slide Dry Goods. They're two ply sport in the bear grass colorway. And if I'm not mistaken, and this is what I kind of found, is that I needed almost the same amount for the border as I needed for the shawl. Slightly less, but almost the same amount. So I did two rows, so one garter ridge 
of the of the border color and then did the applied border. Um, super enjoyable. Right? That is a big applied border, y'all. Okay. Okay. But what I wanted was basically a scarf. And that's what I got. Gus is trying to hide his baby. We've never had a dog that hid stuff before. He buries things in the house a lot. Sorry. <laughs> My daughter just sent me a text that said, can we make an apple pie, please? Recording a podcast, dear. Um, <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you about that. In food news, we've totally made donuts. And it was her idea. Um, we, see, so two weekends ago, we decided to try the yeast donuts. So we did used King Arthur flour recipe for yeast donuts. Um, and I was so like, a lot harder than it was which is funny because I feel like I have a lot of familiarity with yeast dough I used to be a baker um, at an artisan bakery where I made dough bread dough all day long every day <sighs> anyway so I don't know why I was like intimidated by it but it was actually surprisingly like doable um, so we made those and those were very enjoyable but I will say I was they felt uh, they were the, the husband, my husband, those were his favorite. But I felt like I could taste the oil more on them. And I don't know if maybe we needed to do a slightly higher oil temperature. Or if that's just, or if we needed to make like a slightly bigger donut so that it would like had more room to kind of disperse the flavor of the oil. Um, because we made cake donuts this weekend. And then. Oh my goodness. That was a social distancing win, was the cake donuts. Right. They were so good. So we used a recipe called buttermilk don't, cake donuts or something. I'll put it, I'll try to remember to put the link in, um, in the down thing. I'll actually put the link in that one. Um, <laughs> I have never, like, my mamma made cake donuts, but I don't remember. Like, it was either before me or when I was too little to know. Um, and I don't think I've ever been around anybody who ever made them that I can think of. Um, so I was really afraid that they were going to be, like, really heavy or they were going to be... Because, let's be honest with you, a cake is not the easiest thing to master, like, it's very easy for a cake to feel stodgy or heavy. Um, and so I was kind of thinking, like, oh, this is going to be a big learning curve on how this works. Um, I was concerned that the, the dough would be really hard to, to handle. Um, none of the above. They were so light, so airy. It was astonishing. If you've been to New York Sheep and Wool, now they didn't have the same flavor as the as the uh, the apple cider donuts because we just used a buttermilk uh, donut, but they are very similar texture, super soft, very delicate. I was so jazzed about them. And the kiddo even loved them. And the kiddo usually wants stuff to be super duper sweet and I don't, and we both still enjoyed them. We did use a powdered sugar glaze. I might try some without that next time. But, because, but, even, the, but even so, the glaze, you do it when it's hot, and the glaze was very thin. And the, the dough itself was like one cup of sugar to five cups of flour. Next time we'll make a half recipe. It was a lot of donuts. <laughs> Maybe we won't. They were delicious. Um, yeah, I cannot say enough good things. They were delicious so pleased and pleasantly surprised. I forgot to tell you about it till right now. Okay, but that's so donuts. And then <laughs> that's all of my finished objects, right? That's enough, yo. Don't you try and stress me. 
And then I have a new project I cast on the Azor sweater by Orlana Sush. Sorry, I should have looked up how to say that first. So it has, I think, five to eight inches of positive ease and is sized extra small through four extra large, which is a finished chest circumference of anywhere from 37 and a half to 65 and a half inches. So it has a very good size range. It's, <laughs> excuse me, it's knit with fingering weight yarn. Sometimes I forget to tell you guys that and I apologize. Sorry. Everything I showed you was fingering weight, except the shawl, which was sport. This also is fingering weight. So I had some Wisconsin woolen spun, which is Susan B. Anderson's yarn at Barrett Wool. I had Rain Shower and Sherwood. So here is my sweater so far. It's very baby. <laughs> so Sherwood is the blue and Rain Shower is the light gray. And there's my sweater so far. So I wanted, what I was looking for was like just a very casual pullover. Um, I usually don't do a lot of positive ease, but I'm gonna do a little bit of positive ease. I, will, I don't think I'll get to that five inch mark, but you know, I'll probably do three or four. Um, I just wanted kind of like a sweatshirty kind of sweater. Um, so that's what I was looking for. And this one kind of just fit the bill, I think. I'm excited about it. I love Wisconsin Woolen Spun. The yarn is just so pleasant to work with. Um, I should have, I guess I should have talked about dollars too, but I don't ever remember to do that. Um, if you are looking for value in a sweater, a fingering weight wool is the way to go. Um, the sweater that I had on, which is long sleeve, low hip length, um, ended up using not quite, I'm just, I'm just trying to double check. Yeah, not quite 400 grams. So A, that's one, and I am a 56 inch bust. And so that had a little bit of positive ease in it probably, or right at that. Um, so A, it's really comfortable to wear uh, in terms of just weight. Uh, it's comfortable in terms of warmth and you get a lot of knitting value for your dollar. So you're not spent, you, the, the finished garment costs less, just straight up dollar wise but also takes longer, which for me, as somebody who just really doesn't just enjoy knitting, but kind of needs to knit, um, that adds a lot, of, that means I get a lot more value for my project. It takes longer, I get to invest more time in it. And so for me, the time is not just the finished project that I'm spending money on, the finished object the time, the, the dollar amount kind of works in with how long it takes me to do something. Meaning I usually want it to take a little bit longer for my dollar. Did I say that correctly? Hmm. So yeah. If two movies are enjoyable, they cost the same amount to go to, then I might pick the three hour movie instead of the two hour movie to get more value for my dollar. That's kind of what I'm saying. So yay that. And that's the only thing I've cast on, right? That's the only, I mean, other than a sock, that's all I've got actively going, which is kind of feels crazy. But I just am kind of, I'm not sure what to do. I should cast on, what I should do is cast on just um, a hand spun shawl. I should just do like a boomer, like a, uh, Quaker yarn stretcher or something, or just another kind of boomerang hand spun shawl is what I probably should cast on because that would be very therapeutic and enjoyable. Um, but yeah. Okay. Shop update. I will have a shop update the last Friday of March. That's the plan. 
Um, you can find my shop at fatsquirrelfibers.com or you can Google Fat Squirrel Fibers. Um, usually in the show notes, I put my Linktree address, which has links to the shop. It has links to Patreon. It has links to Ko-Fi. If you just want to like say thanks and send a coffee out, um, it's got all that information. So you can find a, a, a link to the shop there. Um, so that's the plan. Okay. So it's mostly a spring update, but there is one except, well, there are two exceptions right because maybe you need a bird with a hat on it and some mushrooms because I do <laughs> so I showed this fabric which was a backing to a little quilt I had done a few weeks ago and I was like why didn't I make this into bags this fabric is stupid cute and so now I have so they're just little sock bags there won't be a ton of them but they will be in the shop update um my sock bags are great for a sock project. They're also great for a hat or like a very small, a small accessory. They do have a pretty good bottom. They'll sit up on their own. So while you're stitching um, and they have a handle, they have a good bot. They've got a good body to them. They're just, uh, I didn't show you, but I showed you kind of by accident. Uh, they just have an unbleached lining. So then in the springtime bags, I also made, oh, mushrooms now these actually have a lining because I really liked it <laughs> right this like it's it's re it, to me at the moment it looks a little bit more flamey orange than it really is but it's this fun orange with metallic print and some mushrooms and strawberries have this in the large wedge size, which I really dig this fabric. Right. So this feels like a good transition to spring, kind of like dirty pinks. Why was I surprised that I liked the, the, this color combination I was wearing early? This is almost it. So that, that green's a little darker, that teal's a little darker, but you know what I mean. Why was I surprised? And now this is a, a the, everything else I'm going to show you today is a quilter's cotton that's been interfaced. This one is a cotton linen slub that's a decorator fabric. So it does not have interfacing. It's just, uh, it still will have body because it's a heavier fabric. It'll still stand up on its own, uh, but it does not have the interfacing. This is what I prefer to do, but sometimes you just can't resist the quilter's cottons. Sometimes they're just too cute. But I, I really like this one. I feel like it's, really dig it. I really like that fabric. And then <laughs> this is my pillowcase fabric that I'm sharing with you. I just love this fabric base for one thing. It is such a good texture. I mean it's a quilter's cotton but just like yarns there's a good there's a pretty good variance even you know, between 100% merino yarns, there's a big difference between bases sometimes. Um, and this is the case with quilter's cottons as well, and I really love the hand of this one. It's a little bit denser. I really like it. And then, in troubled times, Ray Ritchie. Because, you know, woodland animals and tea parties is what y'all need. So this is an interface quilter's cotton with um, a brushed canvas bottom just to help keep it. And it's such a light color. Sometimes I do that just to keep it from getting dingy on your floor. I'm in. Let's go here. So that'll be an update the last Friday of March. Okay. Then... You want to just chit chat for a minute? I feel like I need my knitting, but I probably need to talk to you. I mean, concentrate on talking to you. <laughs> <sighs> so
So yeah, I really, really, I kind of put off recording the podcast in the hopes that like something at least somewhat helpful or peaceful or wise would come to me to say and it hasn't. been intense right so I waited on this part of the podcast just because I was like trying to have something like really helpful to say or you know just some something to center this conversation around in some way like to hang it on or to come back to or and I just I just have to admit that I'm not at that place right now um in terms of like knowing what to say. I mean, we're doing, we're doing fine um, in terms of, you know, our mental health and our physical health. Our household is doing fine. We live in central Indiana. Um, our schools were gonna be going on spring break the last week of March and the first week of April. So um, we closed a week before that. Um, I, my, we do live in the city district. So there's not a lot of e-learning opportunities for folks that just wasn't in place. Not all of our residents um, have access to internet or, you know, the ability to do that at home. And our libraries are closed. So uh, they did, teachers were wonderful and put together things for kids to bring home for instruction. Um, but we'll see how that goes uh, long term or, you know, going forward. Um, Uh, yeah. I send out love to all of you. I think about you. I hope that you can find moments of happiness. Maybe watch some Star Trek Voyager. That's my current, like, coping show. I mean, like, what would Janeway do? I feel like it's a pretty good mantra. Um, it's, <laughs> it's like, I enjoy Star Trek in that especially Voyager, and that Voyager's my favorite. Confessions. Um, and that it, like, is a separate enough from reality that you can distance yourself from emotion at the same time. It gives you a place to have those emotions acted out. Do, do I mean, like, those are still the real human emotions that are happening, but they are feel safer because you're like, oh, those Kazons, they're stealing all the toilet paper. Those Kazons. <laughs> but it can happen at a safer distance. And it's also like ultimately like a show about what we hope we can be in terms of we hope that we can be a moral society and that we can take care of each other and that we can move through adversity with our character and our dignity intact. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where we're at. We're just living our best moment. Like, we're just doing our best. We're trying to hope other people are doing their best. We're trying to believe that other people are doing our best. I had a therapist once who told me like that it's just talking, we're just talking about something and he was like, he was talking about like his view that everybody is doing their best. Right. And that is really hard for me to sometimes hold on to, but I really feel like I can, when I have moments of of fear or anxiety or like, oh, it's really hard to convince myself that everyone is doing their best. But if I can convince myself that everyone is doing their best, it creates greater peace for me. And so it's not doing a favor for other people to think that they're doing their best. It's doing a favor for me to think that other people are doing their best. It's, some t it's really hard to hold on to that, but boy, it does create greater lightness in my person if I can believe that. And so that's what I'm really trying. 
I'm really trying to put that in my heart. I'm really trying to put that in my cells. I'm really trying to know that on a not logical level. Like right now I have to think about it in a logical way. I have to think, I have to override the emotive part of me to say, everyone's doing their best. I wanna be in a place where that is the emotive part of me, that that is what I am truly feeling in all of my person. That's what I really want to be. I want to be a lot of things, but that's one of the things I really want to be. I want to be a person who knows that. But until I can be a person who knows that, I'm really going to try to be a person who believes that. So I'm sending you all so many post-pandemic hugs, so many of them. And I am, I'm not going to lie, I'm a great hugger, okay? I don't want to toot my own horn. Excellent hugging. I am the squishiest, fluffiest, but strong hugger you're gonna find. Okay, that's not true. You might find me somewhere else too. But I mean, I have got it for you. I got the hug for you. And I really hope that you feel it. Because I got it for you. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for doing your best. And I will talk to you next time. Bye.